take a moment and just thank God for all the gifts and tithes that he's given us this morning. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for blessing us. Lord, you bless us in many ways, but Lord, we just thank you that we can give back just a small portion of what you have given to us. Lord, we pray that you take these gifts and use them to further your kingdom, Lord Jesus, both here and around the world. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Christian, for leading us today. And thank you, Judy, as well, for uh, picking out those worship songs and leading us as you have. We appreciate the chance to come together and to worship God. As we continue in our worship, I want to ask you to open up your Bibles. We're turning um, to Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. If you have your Bible, please do turn there. We're going to do actually a more of an extended reading today than we often do. I'm going to read the better part here of two chapters, and I'm always uh, willing to do that, although I always hesitate a little bit because of something I heard years ago, which is that when God's people gather, there is no word that is more important to hear than the exact words of God. And so when we take a little bit more time, it may take a little bit different sense of focus as you lean over to your neighbor's Bible or follow along or just rivet your thoughts on the thoughts of God. But this is uh, unadulterated, the Word of God. I'm departing from our uh, larger series this morning, and I'm just giving a single sermon on this subject, which is titled, In God We Trust. I'm also remembering, now that I'm uh, coming to up here, that we have a few announcements that I should make before we <laughs> read God's Word. And uh, I think uh, we've mentioned before the Samaritan Purse uh, Operation Christmas shoe boxes, they are due here next week. So, wow, that day has come. It seems early. It always seems early, but that day has come for next week. There's also an announcement here that we will have a Gideon speaker here next week and that there will be a special offering taken for the ministry of the Gideons next week. I want you to be prepared for that. If uh, I guess we'll have to have uh, some kind of a box. Maybe you deacons could uh, separate and set up a box just for a deacon fund next week. That would be good to have. And then uh, other reminders that are here. Um, there's a common sense request that we put in pretty much week after week about if you're sick, please stay home. If someone is in your, in your family is sick and it seems like coronavirus type of sickness, then we want to just encourage you for the safety of others just to refrain from coming to church. You can still watch us online. I'm sure many are watching right now as we um, speak. Um, also, we haven't really announced this too much lately, but I do want to just remind you that there are various people who take the coronavirus concerns with very high caution because of their own condition or their own concerns and less so for others sometimes. And what we have asked is that for those of you who are more high caution people in mask wearing particularly, that we want to reserve the last, I don't know, two, three, four rows, depends on, you know, look around, but we want to leave those rows for people who are high caution people and those who are less cautious. We want to encourage you to sit toward the front. And that's a way of respecting those who have the more high caution for those of you who don't to sit forward. And we appreciate that and haven't mentioned that for a while. And so we just want to remind you and refresh your thinking on that. What else is here? Um, I don't think that this isn't written in your bulletin that I know of, but uh, Luke Spicer who has Parkinson's and has been at Heritage House for about a year, has this week moved to Remington House, as I understand it, here in Partyville. I don't know that we can visit him now. It's, it's, he's closer, but uh, just keep that in mind and in your prayers, if you would. It's an adjustment for a man with remarkable um, disability. The last thing, and I don't think that this is in the bulletin either, but uh, you can take out the, uh, open it up to the front uh, prayer page. There's a response form there if you wanted to just tear this off. Um, we are actually a little bit behind on the sponsoring of our serving teams. And uh, so we need people to sign up for serving teams for this month, November, and then the following 
six months. So if you wanted to take that form, we're not passing around clipboards because of the sake of passing around germs, but if you would just take out that form even now and write your name on there, maybe you want to just write the, you know, November, December, January, February, the next six months in circle one, and that would be a month that you would serve. That would be appreciated. We don't have too many church events, and so we haven't really been doing a lot with serving teams lately, although I think that the uh, Barnards receive a meal or would like to receive a meal about once a week, and there are other people who have needs within our congregation that we can't help out. And so, although that might not be a, a, a public uh, church event that you're uh, signing up for when you sign up, there is an opportunity there to serve. So if you would do that, and then uh, maybe you could drop that in Mary's uh, mailbox or just put it in with the offering box, and I'm sure it'll go in the right place. Other comments or questions or announcements? I see Michael is ready here. Yes. Hey, you may have noticed the white baskets in the yard out here. Those are disc golf baskets, and so we're putting in a little nine-hole disc golf course, and that's open for anyone to play and open for the public as well. A uh, couple things on that, just for kids' sake. Um, there, we have monkey bars. They're over there, okay? So don't climb on the baskets. Don't sit in the baskets. It's not the imaginary frozen. Oh. Ball. Hey, thank you, Michael. Michael and a team here spent quite the most of the day yesterday putting those in, and they've been donated by others, and we're thankful for that, and we hope that that'll be a good outreach. Thank you, Michael, for kind of leading that crusade for us all. Well, we turn our thoughts next to the Word of God, and here we are in Isaiah chapter 36. We're beginning in, in uh, the first verse in the 14th year of King Hezekiah. Follow along with me as we read God's Word. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh, from Lachish, Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. And he stood, the Rabbi Shaka stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer field. And there came out to him Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder representatives of Hezekiah went out to the, on the wall to hear from him. And the Rebbe Shekah said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff that will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it, such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. If you say, we trust in the Lord our God, is he not, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed? saying, Judah, to, to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Come now and make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able to set riders on them. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of your masters, my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this land to destroy it? No, the Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabbi Shekha said, 
Has my master sent me here to speak words only to your master and to you and not to all these people sitting on the wall who are doomed to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Then the Rabbishak stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you. For you will, he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. For thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me. Come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree and each one will drink water from his own cistern until I come back and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. But beware lest Hezekiah mislead you saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered us, delivered out of the hand of king, the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sef Arvarim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands has delivered their lands out of the hand that the Lord should deliver you, should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Verse 21. But they were silent and answered not a word. For the king's command was, do not answer them. i just pause there. I really like that response. Because it's like they hear this man boasting. They hear this man ranting and taunting. And they just hang up on him. They don't even answer. They just turn, walk off the wall. <laughs> and leave the proud man in his silence. Verse 21, but they were silent and answered not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer them. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn, which was a sign of their distress, came with their clothes torn and told him the words of Rabshakeh. Verse uh, chapter 31, as soon as King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth, and he went to the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary, and the senior priests covered with sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. And they said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord our God will hear the words of the Rabbi Sheka, whom his master, the king of Assyria, sent to mock the living God, and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant, that is left. When the servants of Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words that you have heard, which the young men of, which the, young men of the king of Assyria have reviled me. But behold, I will put a spirit in him, so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. I'm going to skip from verse 8. Again, the Rabbishak then writes a letter. It comes to Hezekiah. We're going to skip down to verse 14, the receiving of that letter. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. said the same thing as the previous rant. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, and he spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God. 
You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made the heaven and the earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, to hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, to see and hear all the words of Sennacherib with which he has mocked the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of, the, of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and all their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands of wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from the hand of all the kingdoms of the earth, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. Verse 21, then Isaiah, the son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to skip over uh, that uh, portion all the way down to, we're just going to take the summaries of this beginning down in verse 28. Thus says the Lord, I know you're sitting down and you're going out and you're coming in. This is God speaking to the king of Assyria. And I know you're raging against me because you have raged against me and your complacency has come to my ears. And I will put a hook in your nose and a bit in your mouth and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. Verse 30. And this shall be a sign to you this year. This is a sign to Israel now. And this shall be a sign to you, God's people. This year you shall eat what grows of itself. The second year what springs from that. And the third year you shall reap, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of, remnant of, the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant out, out of the Mount Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege mound against it. But the way that he came, but by the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord, for I will defend this city and save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. That's the end of the quote, and then the epilogue in verse 36. And the, king, and the angel of the Lord, actually from first, Second Kings 19, which has a parallel account to this, there are two extra words that are added there, and so I'll read those in there if you're following me in verse 36. And that night... Those are the two extra words. And that night, the night they prayed, and that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived in Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of his God, Adram Melach and Sharezer, his sons, struck him down, struck him down with the sword, and afterward escaped to the land of Ararat and Esh, Rad, Eshadon, Esherhadon, his son, reigned in his place. This is God's word. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to us. We pray, Lord, that you would humble us before you in these times and that we would also learn to trust in you and to pray and that we would know that you are the one that we can trust. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're looking at Isaiah 36 and 37, and I want to point out here Four things that were true in that day, in this historical time that we just read. Four things that were true then that are also true today and how that makes a difference to us. Four things then and four things now. 
The first thing that we see here, just looking back at the historical narrative, is we see a very formidable foe. That's the first thing that we see, a very formidable foe. And that foe is the nation of Assyria, the king, the great king, as he calls himself, of Assyria, Sennacherib. This nation is a super power. It's located nearby to the nations of Israel. And so it is a what we would call in our language today a battleground state. It's between nations. And they were fighting over that area. And they wanted to own every area that they could. And so as these larger superpower nations fought, they would come down. And they had come down here in this time, and Assyria had devastated the northern kingdom, including Samaria and all the towns in Samaria, and now they are devastating all of the southern kingdom towns, and their last stop is Jerusalem. And so in this chapter, the greater threat, the formidable foe of Assyria takes the face of this unnamed man. He's only cited by his title, the Rabashaka, or the Rabshaka. He comes down at the king's command and as his messenger, he gives this taunt to intimidate and to threaten God's people and to instill fear in them. And then with military might, he will set up the siege works and he will be the one to conquer and take everything from Jerusalem and from the people of Jerusalem. Does that sound in any way familiar? This great threat, this great looming threat that is made, this taunt, that's really what this last presidential election has been trumped up to be by both sides, has it not? We have two people who have been presented to us, and if one is chosen, we get what we want, and if one and if the other is chosen, then we lose everything. Our whole nation, our whole way of life is in danger. One of these is a friend of America, and one of these is the arch enemy of America. And I'm asking this. By and large, people have bought into that narrative. Have you? Have you bought into that narrative that our lives, that our well-being as a people, that your present and your future well-being, that the nation of this, that this nation, its future is in the hands really and truly of two people and one is good and one is bad. Have you bought that narrative? If you have, then probably you have been undone. You've been looking at this. Oh, one of these is a friend and one of these is an enemy. And of course, the world is our formidable foe. The world is our formidable foe as the church of Jesus Christ. That's true. The world is populated by godless men and godless women. They live all around us. We have godless laws and we have godless judges and we have godless goals and we have godless institutions. And every nation surrounding us would probably be glad to see our nation crumble, wouldn't they? In one way or another, we are a a godless people, a godless nation. And that's what the people of God stand out from. That's the way it is for the people of God. The people of God are surrounded by godless people. Do we expect, do we expect that the world we live in, or the United States of America in particular, is godly? Do you expect that godless people will be godly? Do we expect that? Do we really expect that? Have we failed to distinguish, really, between the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom that God is setting up for all of those who are saved? That do, we, do we fail to disconnect, to make the distinction between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world that are passing away? Here, we have both right here in our text. We have the kingdoms of this world, and we have the kingdom of God, and we have these two coexistent realities through every age and they don't change much. We have the kingdom of God, and we have the kingdom of this world. And almost always, not always, but almost always, these two are in warfare against one another. The kingdom of this world is against the kingdom of God. So we have, in the first place, a very formidable foe. 
Secondly, and consequently, we have a very shaken people. They're called a remnant here, a very shaken remnant. We have a very shaken remnant, a godly remnant. The year here is somewhere in the mid-700s B.C. The backdrop is that the king of Assyria has come down and conquered all of the towns in a 40-mile radius around Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is officially, anyway, the last standing city in that nation. And probably that's not just Jerusalem. That may mean it's just the city of Jerusalem, but probably the word had come down for a long time that Assyria was on the march and one town after another was falling. And, but in all likelihood, people from the surrounding towns in Judah had come to Jerusalem. Maybe they brought their families and their baby, their children, their, their, all the belongings that they could put on their donkeys and their carts. But they left everything. They left their homes. They left their crops. They left their fields with the animals and livestock in them. And they've come into Jerusalem. And so what we have when we come to Jerusalem is we have not just the city of Jerusalem and those that would live there on any day, but we have all of the people who are fleeing from this terrible foe. And likely... They had begun to flee and come to Jerusalem, seeing that Jerusalem was their last-ditch hope for survival. So the people in Jerusalem, no doubt, are afraid. They've gathered. They've seen people gathering from these other places, and they're afraid. They've heard the taunts, whether they heard them directly on the wall or whether they just heard them repeated wherever they went. They've heard these taunts, probably that one taunt particularly. If you don't give in, then you will eat your own dung and drink your own urine. You will live inside this place, and even if we can't break in here in two years, you're going to die of starvation and thirst. So we have the people in Jerusalem, we can imagine them very shaken, maybe asking questions like this, can we believe Hezekiah? Can we trust in the Lord? Is our God like every other God that the Assyrians have come down and and burned? Um, Is he no hope at all? Is defeat inevitable? Does God see us in our extremity? And probably, I'm guessing, I don't think it's just too much of a guess. I think this is what's really happening. In Jerusalem, there was undoubtedly a lot of praying and a lot of wondering and a lot of anxiety, probably a lot of sleepless nights as people were living there in fear. And God was clearly testing his people. Would you agree? God was testing his people here. But the good thing that's happening here that's not mentioned in the actual text is that what isn't said here in this chapter is said in other places in the Bible, and that is that during this time, before this time, and after this time, during the reign of Hezekiah, there was a great revival that was taking place in the land of Judah, in this land. This, there was a great revival. In fact, if you just think in broad strokes of this whole period of the Old Testament, you have <clears throat> king David was a great king. You have Hezekiah was a great king. And then you have uh, King Josiah as a great king. There were some better kings and a lot of worse kings than those all along the way. But those are the three times of revival in the nation of Israel. There was under David, there was under, under Hezekiah, and there was under, under Josiah. And here we are at the time of Hezekiah. And so presumably there are hundreds and thousands of people during this time of revival who have been seeking the Lord, who have been turning anew to God and praying and seeking His face. And we pick this up a little bit also in the language that's used to describe the people who are left in Jerusalem, as they're called three times in this passage. They're actually referred to as the remnant, the remnant, the remnant. And that's an unusual term. That doesn't just, in most cases, that doesn't just mean the stragglers, you know, the few that weren't picked off. The remnant, actually, generally, it refers to those whom God is saving out of all of the rest, those who are the spiritually alive seed who believe and carry the torch of faith from one generation to another. That's the remnant that's being spoken of here. And so during this time of revival, and people gathered in Jerusalem, there is this remnant there. Now, why is that significant that God has spared this remnant? It's significant, I believe, because in a very real sense, that is exactly what we are as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ today. 
We are God's tiny remnant in this world who believe in him and have been called by him and have been chosen by him and who are precious in his sight and who are being spared and who are being protected. Let me remind you of two things here. The first is that as God's remnant, whether in the past, in this historical account here, or in the present day, God never forsakes his remnant. God never forsakes his remnant. And so cling to him. And he is trustworthy. Put your hope in him. He takes you as precious. Our well-being isn't dependent on the White House or the Supreme Court of the United States. Our hope is not in these. We are God's loved ones, and we are God's chosen people. That brings me to the second point here. Maybe someone will even debate me on that and say, we're not God's chosen people. That was the Jews. We're not God's chosen. They are God's chosen. And I want to just, uh, I want to just challenge that notion a little bit here. It's true that the Jews in the Old Testament from Abraham onward were considered God's chosen people, and they were called God's chosen people. And God does make a promise to those chosen people, to the descendants of Abraham, does he not? He says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. You've heard that. You've heard that stated. That was the Abra part of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12, I believe, early in chapter 12. He says, I will bless those who bless you, Abraham, and I will curse those who curse you. And it was speaking not only to Abraham, but his descendants. And so I just want to say to you, if you are a remnant, then you are today God's chosen people. And what God promised to Abraham is speaking indeed about you. And to bring this into cl clearer focus biblically, I want to just ask you to open up your Bibles. We're going to just turn to two places. I want to give you three demonstrations of this remnant being the New Testament church, being us. Uh, I want to give you three demonstrations of this, and the first we can find in Galatians chapter 3. And basically all saying the same thing, I'll just, but uh, the first one here is in Galatians chapter 3, and then I'm going to begin reading from verse 27 down. What we're seeing here is no distinction made between the Israelites, those of Jewish ethnicity, and the Gentiles. They are all one as the chosen people of God and Abraham's seed. So if you're following with me, we're in Galatians 3, verse 27. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's a conflict that's going on inside of the church in Galatia, just as background here, a conflict between Jews and Gentiles within this church. And Paul is doing all that he can to sow this conflict up, to bring this, to, bring this church to unity. And he goes on and he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. For you are all one in Christ. The church, much effort through the New Testament, we see this, is made to unify the church, Jew and Gentile, together. Verse 29, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And so if you are a child of God, if you are a remnant in this age, you are Abraham's offspring, Turn and we'll see a similar thing found in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. We see the very same thing. All the language that's given to the Old Testament Israel is now placed on the church, the New Testament church, as Peter addresses believers, both Jews and Gentiles, in the New Testament. He says, this is 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and following, 9 through 11. But you are a chosen race. That's the language given to Israel, isn't it? He's talking to the church, however. But you are a chosen race. You are a royal, a kingly priesthood. 
You are a holy nation. These are titles that were reserved in the Old Testament only to the Jews. They're now being given to the church. You are a holy nation. You are a people for God's own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. For once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received receive mercy. So I give you those two specific texts, and then in addition to those two texts, as a demonstration that we are God's remnant, that the church is God's kingdom, that the church is the kingdom of God, composed of both Israel and uh, believers from the Gentile, as a, as, a sec, as a third demonstration of that. I would just bring to you all of the book of Acts, all of the book of Romans, all of the book of Ephesians, all of the book of Galatians, which are emphasizing in very clear language the unity that all believers have in Jesus Christ, in the church, and that the church is the kingdom of God. We are God's chosen people. So I just want you to think about that. We are the remnant. And the reason that that's significant is, I'll just say this, I'll be a little bit more blatant here, and that is that often you will hear what I believe is a commonly repeated falsehood, that the reason God blesses America is because America protects the nation of Israel. You'll hear that. I've heard that a dozen times in the last dozen weeks, probably. The reason that God protects the United States of America is because we protect Israel. And I'm all for protecting Israel. Don't get me wrong on that. But the Abrahamic promise to protect the remnant, those who are of the seed of Abraham, includes us. And so it's not just the protection of some Israelites in another, in another, on the other side of the globe who do not even fear God and do not believe in his Messiah. It's not the protection of those that God's Abrahamic promise is specifically speaking of, but it's to all who are Abraham's true seed. And those are the ones who believe through Christ and are brought into this great people. So we have a formidable foe. We have a very shaken people. And thirdly, we have a very godly man. There are actually several godly men in here, but we're just looking at the one. We're looking at Hezekiah. And as we do, we're looking at Hezekiah's response here to this serious impending calamity. Hezekiah hears the taunting that comes from the king of Assyria. He tears his garments. He puts on sackcloth. He goes, I love this, he goes straight to the house of God. He finds that place where he can fall before God in absolute humility. He goes to straight to the house of God. He prays. He summons Isaiah also and others to pray. Likely, by his example, he's summoning all of Jerusalem to pray, to fall before him. By his setting the example and putting on sackcloth, identifying with all of the other people. No doubt, many put on sackcloth. Many fell down and prayed as he did. And I love the language here as it says, he went in, what is it, uh, chapter 37, verse 14, it says, and he spread it out. He took the letter and he spread it out before the Lord. I can picture that as a scroll. And he goes into the temple and he unrolls that scroll, maybe puts a weight over here and a weight over here. All these words mocking God and threatening God's people. And he, he just lays that out before the Lord. Lays that out. This is actually a very rare thing that we're seeing here in biblical history as well as in modern history, that a great leader, even a nationally known leader, would fall on his face before God in absolute humility and pray. We have our leaders on rare occasions who will call for a special day of prayer or who will observe some you know, presidential uh, prayer breakfast or something like that. But I would ask you, where have you ever seen in history, in the history of this country or any other country, where great leaders, they fall on their faces 
They rush to the house of God. They put on sackcloth. They tear their clothes. And they plead before Almighty God. I think that this is probably you know, a, a rare example, even in scripture, in biblical times. It's a rare example, but it's probably exactly the thing that God is speaking of in Second Chronicles seven fourteen, which we've read a few times lately. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear their prayer and I will heal their land. This isn't a call to pray, you know, 12 times over 12 weeks. Uh, this is a call to humble ourselves and fall before God in humble, earnest, pleading trust. I wonder what keeps us from praying like this. By the way, it's not just our leaders who don't pray this way. It's not just our bosses. It's not just our community leaders. Um, who do you know that prays like this? Do you have a father who prays in this way? Do you have a mother who prays in this way, who humbles herself and falls before God? Do you pray in this way? What keeps us from praying in this way? Is it that we're too busy? Don't have time to pray? Is it that we're too confident in ourselves? Is it that we don't even see how much we really need God's help? Is it that we're just happy being happy Americans? Is it that we seldom humble ourselves enough to recognize how unbelieving we really are? It's too bad, isn't it? I'm sure that we're missing out many on many, many blessings that we would have if we would humble ourselves and pray. Two things to notice about Hezekiah's prayer. One is just the example that he sets as a praying man and how that example was seen and then taken up by others as they, along with him, would pray. And the second thing to recognize here is the overwhelming uh, result, the overwhelming effect of these prayers. They prayed and when, God, when they prayed, two things really amazingly happened. One is that the promised king of Assyria, the proud king, as promised, was cut down by the sword of his own son in his own land. He heard a rumor, he went back, and there he was worshiping in the house of his God. And just as Isaiah had said in response to these people praying, his own sons came in and killed him. The other great thing that happened was the Rabishak's, Rabshakeh's army of 185,000 men, half the population, I would guess, of, of Madison, right? A huge army that's encamped all around this city of Jerusalem. In one night, they simply dropped dead, removing the threat removing the concern about this great foe so that all of these people who were locked up inside that city could go back to their homes and back to their farms and back to their lives, which is to say everything changed when Hezekiah humbled himself before God and prayed. We have a very formidable foe. We have a shaken, very shaken remnant and a very humble, praying man. And lastly, we have a very solid trust. So Hezekiah is named here also uh, Isaiah and Eliakim and Shebna and Joah, maybe a few others named, many unnamed. They trusted in God. They simply trusted in God. They took no other course. They trusted in God. The Rabshakeh had mocked God. He had mocked all the other gods of all of the other people. But as Hezekiah points out, all of those other gods are not really gods at all. They're not gods. They're man-made gods. And when you're in trouble, what kind of a god do you need? What kind of a God do you need when you are the one who is in trouble? You need a great God. You need the great God. You need the God who actually is, right? 
And in every age, here in the Old Testament time and today, people are always inventing gods. Gods of their own suiting, gods of their own little identity groups, right? And so now we have the LGBT-friendly God, and you can go and worship him down the road here, right? We also have the feminist God, and if you want the feminist God, you can find a place to worship her. And if you want, and we have a God who doesn't send people to hell anymore, and you can worship that God. We have a God who is the God of health and wealth and happiness. And a lot of people are worshiping in those churches today. And they're worshiping health and wealth and, and happiness. They're worshiping there. And then we have the God of reason, which you don't have to go anywhere to, reason, to worship the God of reason because the re reason is just inside your head. Self-worship, what I think. And then, of course, we have the red, white, and blue all-American God that says, as long as we're red-blooded Americans, we can live as we wish, we can speak as we wish, we can do what we want, we can mock, and we can dethrone God day after day in the public square, and then we can sing, God bless America, and we have this warm and fuzzy feeling that the red, white, and blue God will always be there for us, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter how we live. Here's the problem in the end of the day, however, and that is that no matter how popular any particular God, so to speak, would be, none of them are actually gods. They are not truly God. They are the gods that men have made, not the God who made man. And so these gods, they don't hear, they don't see, they don't know. They are not almighty. They do not act. They do not rule the world. They, do, they are not from everlasting and to everlasting. They do not reveal themselves across all human history. They do not come down. They do not save. They do not speak. They do not care. They come, do not come to the aid of God's remnant. They're a joke that's not funny. And yet, brothers and sisters, we do have such a God in whom we can trust. We do have a God who can hear and see and knows, who does span all time, and who does take you as his precious people to be his remnant. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he sits enthroned in the oval office of eternity, right? He is, sits enthroned in heaven, and he loves his remnant. And all who are saved and bow their knee to him are his remnant. And he says to them, Jesus' own words from Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. In God we trust. Father in heaven, we ask that you would help us. We are like these people in history in many, many ways. And we fail as others have failed. And we need you, Lord. We need you to remind us and to strengthen us and to help us to be your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing our closing hymn,